Yes, let's go, let's go. <laughs> I will begin. Today we're going to talk about PyTest. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I will introduce myself. I'm Santiago. I'm a software engineer. I'm from Argentina and I'm currently living in the Netherlands. Um, thanks. I want to say thanks to PyCon France for inviting me. Uh, if you have any question during the talk, you feel free to interrupt me and ask me anything, um, if possible, related to the talk. <laughs> um, OK, let's begin with the basics. I w this uh, last year, I've been testing a lot and learning a lot of new things that I want to share now. Um, I will begin with something really basic, with, which is about testing. Then we will go a bit in depth into PyTest. And then I want to give some small tips about testing. Uh, I hope I have enough time. It's a quite long talk. <laughs> um, so we begin with testing. Uh, what is it? I think, uh, can I ask who's testing their projects? Can you raise your hands? Well, I was expecting more. <laughs> um, so you probably heard that it's an essential part of every project. It should be there. If you're not doing it, you should do it. Uh, it helps you catch bugs early and guarantees a certain behavior. Usually, when you have a requirement from your business or everything, what you want by testing it is proving that it works uh, the way that it's supposed to work. Without testing, uh, there is no way to prove that. You probably did some manual testing and tells you nothing. And for the other, per other people checking your code, they don't know if it's actually working as intended. So usually, we want to test. And it's really important to do it. If you're not doing it, start doing it now. Um, luckily for you, in this talk, we are going to cover PyTest. A lot of features from it, I hope. I have time. Um, let's dive into PyTest. I, like, I really like this talk. Um, PyTest, if you don't know, is a library. It's not part of the standard library. Usually, uh, Python comes with unit test. Uh, but PyTest has grown a lot. And a lot of people prefer PyTest over the unit test that comes uh, with Python. Because it's simple, it has a functional approach, and has a dependency injection. I'm going to explain it a bit uh, later. So don't worry about this now. The important things are that it's simple and it has a functional approach. This means that by simple uh, is that we, are not gonna, we don't need to import anything. We don't need to use anything. And with a functional approach, we just declare a function. We use the assert, which is part of Python. Uh, and that's it. It will just work. If you're using unit tests, usually you have to import the unit test case, create a class, uh, and do all that stuff, which usually, uh, when you are new, it's, it's a lot. Um, so <laughs> the last few years, I've been using a lot unit tests. Um, and it was fine for me. It was like a small kitchen, let's say. I could do stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was OK. It was enough. But uh, then I discovered PyTest. And it was like a huge, beautiful kitchen where you can do a lot of stuff. Uh, and then you don't want to go back. Uh, first, uh, one thing that uh, PyTest has are intuitive tracebacks. This means that when it fails, uh, let's see here we are seeing a unit test. When unit test fails, it doesn't tell us much. Is everything the same color? You have to read a lot. You, you are like, did it fail or not? Mm. Yes, I can see at the end that it failed. But with the um, PyTest, we have a much more expressive or intuitive traceback. First, we have colors. That's usually really useful for the eye. Um, and also, it shows us the difference between the error, where the error happened, what was expected, and what uh, should come. Um, and 
it's really nice. Look at this. White, red. Ah, one more thing. If you are using dictionaries, it, it also shows you the difference between the full dictionary. If you have nested stuff inside your dictionary, usually uh, this doesn't happen. But in, in PyTest, they show you the difference wherever it is in your dictionary. And it has a lot more features. If you are using a unit test, you can already replace it with PyTest. You can select a specific test, uh, in this case, PyTest minus K, and an expression there, it could be, I don't know, customer, and it will take all the customers that start, uh, all the tests that have in the, in the name customer, and it will run them. Then you can mark your test, you can uh, skip, Xfail means that uh, it's supposed to fail, so you can mark it, and you can create your own custom marks. For example, if you're writing a smoke test, you can create a mark, smoke test, mark them, and then when you run your smoke test, you run pytest minus m uh, smoke test, and it will run only your smoke test test. And it also uh, can run from last fail test, And then uh, how to use it? I wanted to introduce this slide because it's super simple. Uh, basically, we install PyTest, and then we run PyTest and the path. The path is optional. Uh, you can uh, ignore it. But if you put the path, you can even select a specific file to run the test from that file. So it's super simple. There is not much to do in order to start using it. Um, and then how it works? Usually in our root, in the root of our project, we have the source folder, or the in Python we usually use the name of the project, and then we have a test folder, the test. Inside the test folder, we have to create our files, which should begin with test, or should end with test. Uh, we can see that on the first uh, code of log. And then inside the files, the functions, the functions should begin with test. If we, um, here there is a class, the class is optional, but I put it uh, just to show, if you are going to use a class to group your test, the class should begin with test as well. And that's it. If we do that, we just run PyTest, and it will run our test. It's, I think it's also quite similar to unit test, so that's why it's a drop-in replacement. Uh, as far as I remember, it covers almost everything from unit test, so you can just start using right away, only for the benefit of the colors. That's, I think, is enough. Um, then something really important that you have to remember when writing tests is that your tests are your documentation as well. You not only have to write documentation, which is really important, uh, your tests are useful for people who is going to use your library um, to realize how to use these, the different functions from your, from your software. Uh, let's see an example of what I mean with this. In this case, we are doing a client post, and there is something really ugly, <laughs> which is the dict. In this case, the dict first is ugly because uh, usually it's not recommended to declare a dictionary this way. Uh, but also, it's not telling me much about what's going on there. If we look at the next one, ah. if we look at the next one, by declaring the um, a payload function, when I read this line, I know that I have to provide a payload. Ah, a payload. So the payload is probably a dictionary. When you look at the previous one, uh, you are not sure what is that. It's, do I need to provide a dict? Can I provide something else? This one is telling me a payload. Okay, the payload should look like this. Maybe these are not the best examples, but I want you to get kind of the, the idea. Another example here, we're using a function generated base version, and it receives two parameters. These parameters, it's not clear what they are. So when I read the test, I'm like, but w what are they? What, what's the meaning of them? Maybe I can find the value of test input 
0 and 1. But then my brain is, uh, what does it mean? Then I have to go to the source code and read what are the arguments. But if you add two lines, which is not the problem, uh, then you realize when you read general version, current version, and increment. Um, I think, at least for me, when I read a code like this, it's more clear on how to use, and I don't have to navigate through the source code. Any questions so far? We're gonna go into fixtures. This is tough. Ah, no, no, it's not tough. Um, fixtures, if you have used unit test, uh, usually in unit test you have a setup and teardown in your test case, blah, blah. And PyTest introduces a concept of fixtures, which they are basically attachable functions. This is kind of uh, what I meant by dependency injection. When I, when I um, add a decorator fixture to a function, uh, let's say in this case, new customer, then I declare a new customer in, I pass new customer as an argument to my function, and PyTest will take care of injecting that uh, the executed function into my test. So in this case, I get new customer. Uh, I can call the dictionary that is return equals join. Um, all of these uh, fixtures have different scopes. We have function, class, module, package, session. If you want to understand all of them, uh, I recommend to go and read the docs. But um, I will explain only two. The function, it will execute the fixture per uh, function, per test, let's say. So in this case, we can see the uh, memory address is different. So we saw previously here new customer uh, was passed to the function. Let's imagine we have two tests. So when we use the scope function, these two tests will use different, uh, the output of the fixture will be different for both of the tests. But when we use scope module, uh, it will use the same instance. It's like uh, it's cached. This is usually used to speed up your test when you want to reuse the output of a fixture. But at the beginning, I think you won't need it. I, I'm just showing it that it's possible. Um, the fixtures also replace the concept of setup and teardown. Uh, does anyone, who doesn't know what is a setup and teardown? Okay. Um, so when testing, the classic uh, X unit from Java, the, the idea is to have a, a class which has setup and teardown. This means that um, you will do something before and after each test is executed. Um, for example, if you have to, if you realize that on every test, you are creating a user, then you can take this logic out and you put it in the setup, and it will create a user for every test. It's to remove, a, it's to avoid repeating code. But in, um, in PyTest, they have a different approach because what happens this way, you maybe avoid repeating code in the setup and teardown of a class, but if you have many classes doing the same or similar things, you end up repeating code inside the setup and their class. So PyTest introduces the fixtures, and when you use yield, you are like separating the test into setup and teardown. And you can even uh, yield a value. We can see here in the example that we are receiving 10 files from the fixture. And then we assert that TMP. I created a, I am creating a temporary file, so the path will have TMP, and it's being yielded. The path could do something. 
Um, and then at the end, so let's uh, review. First, we are creating a temporary file. I yield the value. So when I yield the value, my function, my test is executed. And then it goes back to the temp file and executes the OS remove when the test is done. Um, if you find it hard to understand this concept, I uh, recommend you to play with it. And once you do it a few times, you will be like, ah, aha, this is what it does. And of course, you can ask me more questions. Um, and then the fixtures can be used as factories. So uh, basically, what we do is we declare a function inside the function. And when we return this function, uh, by test, we'll execute, in this case, new customer. But what the result will be will be a function. So when we call the function, we can uh, use it as a factory. In this case, we can see that I'm creating two new customers, John and Mike, and comparing them. Um, then we have, um, that's it for now with the fixtures. Now we're going to start with parameterize. This is another cool feature from PyTest. Um, and basically, what you do is you um, group some values. Usually, maybe you are writing many tests, and you realize all of, the, all of them execute the same logic, but what changes is just the value. So you can group all the values and give it to one single function which will execute the test multiple times per value. We can see here, uh, this is from a project I, I have, um, where we use the December to increment the version of the, to increment the version. So what we're giving is the current version, the increment, and the expected value. The code will be always the same. So instead of writing a test per each one of these versions, I just group them and I give the values to the uh, to one single test. We can see how it works here. So I have to declare the values, the, um, the name of the variables that will be injected into the test. Then uh, configuring PyTest is really easy. You can do it either using pytest.ini, which is a file, uh, that goes outside the, the test folder, or you can use the conf test py function, which is more, um, let's say, code oriented. You can uh, programmatically set the stuff in the conf test. Uh, and in the conf test.py, you, you can make your fixtures available to the other tests. So let's say we had this new user. Uh, and we are copy and pasting into different tests. So at one point, we are like, wait, I should be reusing this. So you create a conf test.py, you move it there, and then uh, you don't have to import anything. In your test, you directly import, uh, no, you create a parameter with the name of the fixture, and that's it, you have it available. Um, well, this I already said. Um, the conftest.py allows us to create, uh, to configure PyTest programmatically. We have access to almost everything in PyTest. Also, we can create, um, we can parse arguments. So let's say we want to test only the smoke test. We could potentially add um, an argument, smoke test. So when I run PyTest, uh, test, dash, dash, smoke test. We could write some logic to collect all these motives and execute them. So it's quite, it's super flexible. Um, then we have mocks. Um, mocks are not part of PyTest, but I want to talk a bit about them. Uh, they come actually with unit test, but we can use them uh, with PyTest. Um, Basically, what they are are callable and create attributes as new mocks when you access them. What does this mean? 
uh, who is using MOX or has used MOX? Ah, few. Um, so basically, a MOOC, I think it's an idea that also comes from Java. For us, in Python, it's a, a class that when you instantiate that class, you can start calling different methods inside uh, of that instance, and it will never fail. It, it will never say uh, this attribute is not found, or we don't have, you don't have, you haven't declared this function. It will give you something back, even if you start nesting. Let's say you, let's see an example. Uh, we import from unit test, then we instance, we create an instance of mock. And then we call get users. This get users was never created on inside mock. But when I call it, uh, it gives me a new mock pack. And that mock is created. Before it didn't exist, but now it's created. So if I call it again, it will give me the same mock. And if I keep calling, for example, m dot get users, and then I do dot name, it will give me a new mock. And we can configure each of these mocks to return a value or a, have a side effect, like write an exception or do something else. So let's see in practice how it would work. Um, remember that they re the mock records also how they are used. So let's say the, here I called get user twice. So that mock get users, because it's a mock inside a mock, knows that it was called twice. In this case, we are creating a serializer. Let's say we have a serializer class. And it receives a protocol. And then we are going to serialize based on this protocol. Um, the protocol is not hard coded. This is important. And I will explain it later, at least for me. Um, so we create the protocol, the, we create a mock, and we call it mock protocol, and we give it to the serializer. Then we create a, a payload, and we call the function serialize. Now, uh, what the mock allows us to do is, if we look at the return self protocol serialize inside dev serialize, uh, we see that our mock should be called with serialize function and the payload given to it. So at the end of our test, we can check that that mock, the mock protocol dot serialize, was called with the payload given. And this is super cool. So any questions? Let's go to the. Next one. And now we are going to cover a bit about TDD. Uh, TDD is a super cool technique that I was not used to, to do. And I started doing it. And I was surprised as how good it is, how it helps you guide the way you code, uh, helps you write, write robust and simpler code. And you have to let your test guide you, not the requirements. We are going to see now. An example, let's say we have our requirement is to create a meetup that returns status. This status should be either running, over, or coming soon. It's three different status. Usually, the people giving you these requirements are not technical, so they are going to tell you running when it's happening now. They may not even give you the, the states, but I'm giving you the states. Uh, they will tell you when it's over, it means that it has already happened. And when it's coming soon, uh, it has not happened yet. And it's up to us as engineers to decide how we are going to uh, code this. Let's say we have uh, the, meetup, the meetup class. It has a beginning and an end date, start and end time. The first thing we do is. We say, OK, I'm going to start writing one test for running. We write the test. The test should uh, give me running when uh, I provide the, 
the start should be yesterday and the end date should be tomorrow. This means for me that it should be running. So I make a, a test, I execute it, and it will fail, of course, because we haven't declared the status yet. So what we do is we make the first test pass. In this case, I just return running. This will make it pass. Fine. So now we go to the next one. It's important to realize that we add the least amount of code. Like uh, here it's solved. That's it. If that, was, if that were the requirement, then this is enough. If we only have to return running, this would be enough. But uh, now we want to test for coming soon. So when we run the code, it should fail, of course, because we said running. Um, so what we do in order to make it pass is we add the least amount of logic to make it pass. In this case, uh, when start time is bigger than now, return coming soon. When I first started doing this, I added uh, if self start time uh, lower than now and lower than self end time, but because I was not doing TDD, and that doesn't make sense. In this case, we don't need the end time. With just start time, it's enough to know that it's coming soon. And it's passing. Then, uh, for the last one, for over, we run the test, of course, it will fail. And we make it pass by adding, as again, the least amount of logic. Um, when now is bigger than end time, it means that it's over. And it's passing. Now, some things, uh, what would happen if start and end day are swapped? This would be an error from the system, the developers, uh, an API sending the wrong information. Should we write an exception or, or let someone else check this flow? Uh, our design is done and we could finish there. But uh, in this case, I'm going to add a check on the setup. But this is, um, this is no longer part of, I mean, uh, this is not part of the requirement, but it's up to us to realize that there is like a side effect, effect that could happen. So we added test for that, and uh, we say that it should raise an exception. Because this is not a part of the requirement. We just want to fail. When you give me wrong information, fail. And in PyTest, we can add the just, we can use PyTest rises. Time error is my class. In this case, it failed because we are not covering yet that case. So um, we add a check for the rise time error. If self start time is bigger than end, day, end time, we should rise time error. This, and we can see that in the next lines, we don't need even to compare for coming soon. We don't need to do anything regarding uh, end time. We just check only on start time. For over, we should check that end time. And with the um, validation that we are doing at the beginning, we prevent a lot of bad cases. And this part remains the same. This one, uh, we can say that is the official requirement from business. And the test pass. Um, now, the question is, can we refactor a bit this? As we saw before, all of the tests I don't know if you paid attention, but most of them are the same. Let me see. We are only changing over in this case. In this case, we only change coming soon. They are all the same. Let's go back. Tuk, tuk. Yes, we can refactor it. Uh, and we can use parameterize. We, uh, I explained it before. Basically, what we do is we collect the, the data that changes into, let's say, I, ha I didn't have a space, so I skip the variable declaration. 
but let's say we save this array into a, a time variations. So here we have a, here we have the parameterized, and we say start, end, and expected the outcome. We, our function receives those values, we instantiate meetup, and we assert that meetup.status is equal to expected, and it passes, four passed, and it's, by doing this, we skip repeating all the code over and over and again. In this case, does it look better? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's up to the devs to choose when to use it or not, because if you look at this, this for me also doesn't tell me much. In this case, I just wanted to show you. <laughs> Maybe it's better just to use a, a test like this. But there are many other cases, especially when you deal with strings, that uh, it does look better. Um, now, what we can conclude from all this information, uh, I mean, what can I conclude? <laughs> this is my conclusion. Uh, so first, I realized that it's usually important to benefit composition over inheritance. We saw it on the mock example with the protocol. I was not inheriting from another uh, class, or it was not hard-coded as part of the class. I was passing as parameter because then this helped me, helped me write a better test because I was able to mock it. Otherwise, you end up patching your code. Uh, this does not apply to every case, but there are many cases where you are coding and you, are, you realize, oh, wait, I can make this a parameter and it will help me test better. And usually, uh, when it's easy to tell, uh, uh, when it's easy to tell, to test, it means that it's easy to use, at least in my experience. Um, then we have some plugins. Uh, PyTest has a big ecosystem. It's really easy to write plugins. You can check on the documentation. It, they explain there is a plugin for Django. If you're using Django with this plugin, it's really easy to stop using the uh, unit test uh, from Django or the API test case. Then there is a coverage, PyTest coverage, which has a dash dash cov and something else and it will create the coverage report with colors, it's really nice. And then there is a plugin for PyTest Asyncio. Uh, this is for testing async code. If you are testing async code, I am not, but uh, if you are testing with unit test, usually you have to create your event loop manually and deal with some stuff. With this plugin, it becomes really easy because you just add a decorator to your test which you say this is a sync, and PyTest will take care of creating the event loop and all that stuff. I think it's really useful. Um, then some resources. It's just two, actually, because the middle is part of PyTest documentation. But we have the PyTest doc. They are really great. They are super good. And then there is a free book called Clean Architectures in Python. Um, it's from a guy, he decided to uh, give it for free. And it covers a lot of these things, uh, but much more in depth. So if you're interested in this, just check it out. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, anyone has questions? You can also ask me later if you want. Thank you.